I'm Paul Salahuddin Armstrong. I embraced Islam in the year 2000. I was born in uh, Bromsgrove because at that time Redditch didn't actually have its own hospital. Um, but I, I lived uh, my childhood in Redditch with my, obviously my parents. Well, Redditch by and large when I was uh, growing up there was a mainly English town, but there, there were odd people from uh, you know, Indian backgrounds or Pakistani backgrounds or uh, people from the West Indies, but it was predominantly, you know, an, an English area. And my parents were not uh, particularly uh, religious, you know, they, they might put C of E on forms, but they're really kind of free thinkers. So I wasn't really brought up in a religious environment. In fact, religion wasn't really something that I looked into until sort of much later in, in life when I actually went off to university. You know, people often ask me this, was I a Christian beforehand? Well, not really, because I never accepted Christianity. I didn't believe in the doctrines of Christianity. I, I always believed in God, but uh, it was a very personal belief. The first time I heard about Islam was in my middle school. Uh, there was a teacher, if I remember rightly, called Mrs. McLaren. It was in an RE class. And, you know, they had to give some token sort of teaching about other religions. So they mentioned about this religion, that uh, they believed that Jesus was a prophet, they believed in God, um, they didn't believe that Jesus was the Son of God. Um, and I, I remember this really struck a note with me. I thought, well, that kind of makes more sense than what other thing I've been taught. So I, I asked the teacher afterwards, and I said, what is this religion? I'd like to learn more. How well can I find out more? And she says, why? You know, you, you're like English. Why, why would you want to know more about this religion? This is like for Pakistani people and yeah, Arabs. <laughs> and I says, what do you mean? And uh, I says, no, I'm just, I'm just curious, you know. And she says, well, why do you need to know? And uh, so I, I was, what do you mean? And she says, well, what, what religion are your parents? And I says, well, they don't really have a religion. She says, well, are they Christians? And I says, well, they're not particularly, no, but they put C of E on forms. And she says, well, there you go. You don't need to know, do you? And I thought it was a very bizarre attitude to, to take, you know. Obviously, they were just fulfilling their, their quota in the national curriculum of giving some token teaching on a, another religion. But uh, clearly, she wasn't somebody particularly in favour of it. <laughs> I remember another time in school, I, I heard something about the Quran, and I was very curious about this book because it wasn't accessible to me, but I'd heard about it, and I'd heard that it was in some way connected with the teachings in the Bible, but that was all I knew. Um, I really started looking into it after I went to university, and I remember there was a stall in town the one day, and during the, what I later found out was Islam Awareness Week. Uh, but at the time, I just remember I was with my uh, friend, and. Uh, we saw this store with Jesus and Muhammad and all this written on it and it was sort of like a store with like a bit of a tent over it and I was thinking, I said to my mate, oh come on, let's go and have a laugh. Uh, so we went up there and uh, just sort of like, you know, we a bit joking, okay, so what do you believe then? You're going to convert us? And he's sort of, you know, jiving with them. But I was surprised because they, they were very friendly and they didn't take offence at this at all. And he says, would you like a free book? Um, Okay, um, what do you mean? And it's the Quran. I, said, oh, I heard a lot about this book. I've never actually read it. And I says, well, you can have one. And it was actually a um, uh, Muhammad Marmaduke Pictou translation of the Quran. I, I, I don't have it anymore, actually. I gave it to somebody else later on after. Um, but then I've got quite a few translations of the Quran there. Um, but I, I remember I kept this for a long time in a shoebox with my New International Version of the Bible. And Whenever I had problems, I would get this out and I'd start browsing through the Bible and I wouldn't really read much of the Bible. I'd flick through it a bit. It didn't really, at that time, it didn't really strike a chord with me. But I'd read through the Quran and it just really, it always hit my heart. I was thinking, well, this, this is strange. This is actually making sense. But then if I, if I follow this, I'm going to have to stop going out, stop drinking. I can't have any girlfriends. I can't, <laughs> no, 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 that can't be true. But <laughs> So, but I realized something inside me was saying there's, there's a spiritual need, there's something spiritual that I'm missing. So I, I went on a, a quest, actually, if you like. I started investigating different religions, different spiritual groups, 
um, meeting Hindus, meeting uh, Christians of different groups. I visited Hindus, I visited Sikhs, I visited Hare Krishnas, I visited <laughs> all different groups. But every so often I'd keep picking up this Quran and reading through it. And I liked the Quran, I just had a bit of a problem with a lot of the Muslims I'd met. Um, they didn't really strike a chord with me until later on when I met some good ones. And I later realized that there was a certain wisdom to this. After I embraced Islam, it was revealed to me why I'd been sent on this merry-go-round to all these different groups. There was something that Allah was trying to teach me, and I, I didn't see it at first. So, you know, it was a process I had to go through. Uh, during the search that happened after I left university, when I was visiting many different religious places, uh, various different churches, different Christian groups, uh, Hindu temples, Hare Krishnas and various others, uh, this was one of the temples that I actually visited. This is a Sikh temple, uh, also known as a Gurdwara. Uh, I, sp I spent six months visiting here on a regular basis. I, I never converted to any other religion. Uh, I never converted to Sikhism, but it is a place that I benefited from visiting. And one of the things I learned when I was traveling to visit all these different uh, religious communities is that there is something good in every community. Instead of looking negatively at people of different faiths, even if we disagree with with the actual religion itself or it doesn't, it doesn't suit us, we should still respect them. And we can still learn from anybody, whoever they are, whatever faith they are. And this is something which you see within the early Muslims, that in the 12th century they were learning everything. They were learning from the Greeks, they were learning from the Persians, they were learning from all these civilizations that were there before Islam came on the scene. And if we do that now, then why not benefit from the modern science, from modern medicine? from all these different things that we can learn from today's world. There's no harm in that in Islam. And I think this is a, a, a way of thinking which we should really return back to. I enjoy coming to the park on a regular basis because, you know, when you see the beauty of the trees, I mean, it's like this time of year, you see the deciduous ones, they're all changing, the seasons. And when you look at the birds and the ducks and the pond and all of these in all of this is uh, reminders from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from almighty God that all of these things have been created out of his love and compassion for, for his creation I mean where does the ability for the birds to fly and look how effortlessly they fly. This is a wish that all human beings, they've wanted to fly throughout history, but so effortlessly. And the ducks that swim on the water. And Allah says in the Quran that we go on the ships throughout the sea and the, this, the ships sail upon the water, but by God's permission. And this is, miracle when you think about it. I mean, we, we never question, I mean, when a, a ship is heavier than water and how it can actually sail upon the ocean. And we don't question that. And you just look at the immense beauty that is all around us. And people wonder, where is the blessings of God? And they're all around us all the time. And we, we don't, we just walk past them. I mean, you've seen the, the beautiful sky, the, just look at the shimmering on the water of the light. All these little details that everybody misses. Uh, I've, always took, I, I've always took notice of these ever since when I was younger. I've always been fascinated by the nature, even before, even before I actually came to become uh, more interested in spirituality and religion in a, a more generic sense. But, and sure, I mean science, you know, maybe through evolution and whatnot can explain how some of these things may have sort of come together, but they don't explain why. They don't explain what is the purpose behind life, behind the beauty of the creation. They might be able to give us some details on, on the how, but not the why. And this is the thing when I was younger, and it's one of the things that really got me interested in spirituality in the first place, because I've always been interested in science, but the science can't answer these questions. These questions are in the realm of spirituality, 
and in the realm of religious traditions. There's no answers in science for, for why these things are the way they are. And it's during that process of reflection that I became more spiritual and con contemplative of the, the things that I hadn't considered previously. Islam is a complete religion. Uh, it has aspects which are more concerned with how we should live as a society, you know, it's called fiqh, jurisprudence. It's got aspects which discuss more about our spirituality. It's got aspects which are about having connection with this world that we're living in, with life, with uh, such a respect for life. I mean, this is one of the reasons why as Muslims we're supposed to um, let our ego die before we die. It's, it's so that we learn how to live. That's why people go on Hajj. But the sad thing is, when people go on Hajj and they want to visit the places where Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, lived, where he, his family lived, where his companions lived, these have been destroyed. They've been lost. And all because of some people's narrow-minded understanding of Islam, where they, they, they reject the big picture and they're only seeing a small tiny part of it and thinking that that is Islam and they don't even understand that properly. Some people all they say is the uh, Quran and Sunnah and yeah of course I accept that we should follow the Quran and the example of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him but wasn't his example how he was compassionate towards other people, how he thought about other people, how he he didn't want any kind of uh, buildings that were there previously to be destroyed. People today, they, they're following something strange compared to what he followed in his life. And this is something which, it really concerns me. It's one of the things that took me a long time, much longer than I, I, I should have took to actually embrace Islam. It was because I didn't see Islam in many Muslims. And maybe if more Muslims had the reality of the Quran in their hearts and the consciousness of Almighty God, we would see a very, very different picture of the Islamic world than what we see today. And a lot of the negativity that comes towards Islam from people of other traditions is because what they see and what they think of as Muslims is what they're seeing in these countries. And yet a lot of it is nothing to do with Islam. It's a misunderstanding. It's these people don't even know Islam themselves. And hopefully I pray that people will wake up and pick up the Quran and start to reflect and start to understand what Islam is really about, inshallah. After embracing Islam, obviously my life took a different path because my, my whole outlook was starting to change. I was taking my life more seriously and uh, I started to gain more of a responsible attitude than, than I had done previously. It, it's, a, it's a natural sort of thing that happens, you know, to anybody who becomes more spiritual. And I've seen this in other people as well, whether they embrace uh, Christianity or, or another spiritual path, I've seen, tended to find that they're often on more or less the same sort of path in life anyway. They, they become more responsible, they become deeper. Uh, this is also why they tend to, there tends to be a shift away from some of the people that they were hanging around with previously because when you get very deep around people that they're not deep, they, they take a very simple look on things and they, they, you know, they're not interested in the, the deeper questions of the meaning of life. They're not ready to consider that yet. And if you're talking about these sort of things, then it kind of freaks them out a bit. And I think this is something we also have to have understanding for people that they're on different levels. You know, and you know, if we try and push people that are not ready to understand certain things before they're ready, you can really kind of upset them. I think I took a little bit of time before I took my, told my family because I, I wasn't too sure how they would react. Um, but in the end, I, di I did mention it to, to my family and they were saying, oh, well, <laughs> whatever, if, if you want to be a Muslim, fine. I mean, bear in mind, this was before September the 11th, uh, so they didn't have that kind of feeling afterwards of concern or worry. Um, but they did say to me, oh, well, at least you didn't uh, join some crazy cult then. <laughs> I remember them saying this. <laughs> The thing that really kind of made them question a few things and get a bit worried, of course, was the following year in September, there was the tragic incident on September the 11th. 
And I mean, that really, I mean, it came as a complete shock to me as well. I was like, what, how can, that can't be Muslims, surely. You know, because that's totally forbidden in Islam. You can't attack any civilian. Even in the war, you can't attack civilians. Um, and it, it kind of took me aback for a bit and really take a reassessment of certain things. But um, obviously it caused some concern to my family because everything in the media was negative about Islam. Um, but they, they didn't tell me, you know, don't be a Muslim or anything. They just were a bit wary. They, they didn't want to think anything would happen. The other thing, of course, was my brother had also embraced Islam and then he went off to Pakistan for four months, so they got very worried. Um, even though I, I'd actually been suggesting to him not to do it at the time. But uh, alhamdulillah, he did turn out all right in the end and he, he, didn't, uh, he didn't go down any extremist route. But it did cause all of us a bit of concern. And I mean, especially for my family who, let's be honest, I mean, didn't really have such a deep understanding of Islam. So they were, they were as anybody would be concerned if you heard this, a particular religion has these sort of people and you didn't know about that religion. It's very easy to jump to conclusions. For the past couple of years, um, I've been the co-director of the Association of British Muslims. This is on a national level, an extension of something which I've been doing for a number of years locally, uh, working with people from various institutions in, in the community, working with the local communities, just uh, on an interfaith level, on, on a level of uh, helping to provide better public services and understanding between different people. Uh, like I delivered some training to the police and the probation officers, for instance, about Islam awareness. Uh, so I, I'm doing this kind of work now and uh, uh, for the past couple of years that's taken it onto a, a national level as well with my work with the Association of British Muslims. Uh, due to my work with the Association of British Muslims, I often have to attend uh, meetings and functions within London. So I have to travel here. It's a distance of about 120 miles from my hometown. And I do this on a very regular basis, usually every week or so, uh, sometimes more than once a week. Now, when I'm in London, I will attend my Juma, my Friday prayers in the city of London. The Association of British Muslims was originally founded in 1889, originally called the English Islamic Association. It was founded by Sheikh Islam Abdullah William Henry Quilliam, who was uh, given the position by the Khalifa of the Ottoman Empire, Abdul Hamid II. So it's like, it has a tremendous history there, but I mean, any organization over 100 years has done many different things. At the moment, the, we're trying to take the association into more of a humanitarian direction um, based upon teachings of the Prophet Islam, where he showed tremendous compassion and understanding, even for people who are really, really uh, against him and you know his companions and they actually at one point when he was in Medina they wanted to commit a genocide against the Muslims yet Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him afterwards forgave these people when he went back to Mecca I think today many Muslims forget this aspect of the Prophet Muhammad so something his most important aspect he is the Rahmatul Alameen he is the mercy to all of the worlds and he showed tremendous compassion for everybody. He looked after people, who, like this lady who used to throw rubbish at him every time he went walk past her house. Yet the one day he didn't, you know, the one day she didn't, he went into her house and he asked her, are you okay? And when he saw that she was unwell, he nursed her back to health. Because of this, this woman embraced Islam. This is the Islam that we are forgetting today. And this is the Islam that, with the association of British Muslims, that we're trying to rekindle in people's hearts. Congratulate all of you for the occasion of the anniversary birthday of the Holy Lady uh, Hazrat Maksuma, the daughter of our seventh Imam, Musab Jafar, peace be upon him, and the sister of our eighth Imam, Imam Riza, alayhi salatu wassalam, 
because according to some tradition, the first of the months of the Kaaba coincided with her birthday, with her birth. And Hazrat uh, Masum, she has got a special uh, position according to Islamic traditions, which is narrated from three Imams, our Imams. Imam Imam Sadiq, this way upon him, and uh, her father, Musab Jafar. The message in the Quran is purely monotheistic. It's not a tribal religion. It's not a religion based upon the worship of statues or the worship of people or national pride of a particular tribe or something. It's just a pure belief in the creator of the universe. That is what really struck a chord with me because that's what I've always believed. Everything changed since September the 11th. You see the some typical books that have been published these days. And it gives a very negative image of us Muslims. Islam is obviously not about terrorism or people with Kalashnikovs or people who strap bombs to themselves or tell others to do so. But this is a tremendous challenge for us Muslims to, today to show people what is the real Islam. If people only see what the media shows, and then if we, without thinking, actually contribute to their stereotypes by the way we act, by instead of explaining things and showing how this is not anything to do with us, we actually say, well, we have to do this a certain way, we have to do that a certain way, without even thinking, is that actually the best way of doing things in the first place? So we need to have a bit more hikmah, a bit more wisdom, as the Holy Quran teaches us to do so, as the example of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, taught us to do so. And maybe then, inshallah, people will start to see that Islam is not like this, that the vast majority of Muslims do ordinary jobs, our teachers, our scientists, our doctors, our chemists, and in all manner of respects, contributing to the betterment of humanity, the betterment of our society. And we have to show people and be more confident in engaging with the media so people can see that normal Muslims are just like normal other people, but hopefully, inshallah, a little better.